My name is Jeff Fry. I'm a historical reenactor. Uh, I go all over the southeast. I have a Creek Indian fishing camp, a Muscogee fishing camp. And today I'm going to tell you a few things about the area we're in right now, which is uh, Haynes Island, Alabama. It's right along the Alabama River. Beautiful spot. You can see three counties behind me from this hillside. Years ago, the Muscogee people mostly lived along waterways here in Alabama. Uh, they traveled these waterways. It was a way of travel between points A and B, uh, between the different villages and towns. Uh, they had dug out canoes that they formed. Their most favorite trees for these dugouts were, uh, of course, the cypress, the cedar, and also at times, uh, the yellow pine. Uh, they would sink these canoes when not in use so they wouldn't rot. They had canoes that could hold up to 22 warriors. There was one found in the Mobile Bay area. Uh, they have on display at the Mobile Museum of Art. So it's really interesting to go by there and see that. Uh, the things I'm going to tell you today are, are basically dealing with fishing and life among the Muscogee people in the 16 and 1700s. Early on, there was an early explorer by the name of William Bartram that was in this area and south of here. Uh, that he lived with the Muscogee people for approximately 10 years. In his writings about living with the Muscogee people, he, uh, he especially had a, a chapter in there about fishing. He would sit in, the, in there that they had uh, lures, different types of lures, and uh, which is something that he had never saw before. These canoes that the uh, Muscogee people built here to travel the rivers and the waterways, uh, the process before the early Europeans came was one year they would find a, a nice uh, cypress tree, say, that they liked they would take and ring the tree. In other words, cut the bark off the bottom of the tree uh, in a large area. It'd be one to two years before this tree died. After it died, they built a fire around the base of the tree, chipping away with their stone tools at the burnt wood, thereby exposing good wood and continue to burn. They would burn it and let it fall then they would burn it to the length that they wanted it. Set a fire up on it and burn it to that length. Then, most times, they worked on it right there because it's too hard to move. It was too large. And they would take uh, coals from a fire, not the flame itself, just the coals, 
and put along the top of the log, thereby letting it burn, and they would chip away at the burnt wood, exposing good wood, and continue this process. As it got deeper inside of the canoe that they were making, they would line the sides with clay to keep it from burning anymore on the top edges of it, and then continued that all the way down till they got to the bottom and uh, ever what thickness they wanted. Uh, they would actually, if they was a family on a long trip and they were in enemy areas, say uh, along the Tom Bigby where the Choctaw are or were, they would take and uh, a lot of times put a bed of clay in the middle of the canoe and uh, the ladies would actually cook in the canoe in the middle of it. Uh, if they had several large families that was going to go on a trip down river to say another town or village, they would take two canoes and take river cane and lay it across both the canoes, thereby making like a pontoon. And they could get all their goods and, and more people on the pontoon, thereby going down the river to wherever their destination was. different fishing techniques that the Muscogee people used along the waterways here was uh, they bow fish, they spear fished, they uh, fish with traps. Uh, a lot of the gar fish, they would actually glide up beside in the canoe when the gar was on top of the water sunning itself. They would glide up beside of him and actually take a war club hitting him on the head, cracking his skull, and then dragging him back to shore behind the boat. The fishing spears, I've got a couple of types here to show you that they would have used. The tip here is just a bone tip 
made out of bone, out of a leg bone of a deer, sharpened on a brace of stone, and it would they would have taken and drilled a hole through it and drilled a hole through their their spear uh, handle right here. Just stick it in there, it fits firmly in there, and they would sit there along a stream or along the river and wait patiently for a fish to come by and then they would spear him, thereby bringing him back into shore and having fish to eat for that night. Another type is this one right here. Uh, both these are made out of river cane. Uh, these two pieces right here, they would have got uh, the pieces of cane shaped like this. while they were green over a, over a fire. And they would slowly have bent these two pieces into these two shapes. Right here, to catch the fish as you spear him, is two gar teeth. Okay, these would have grabbed him by the sides. These open up to like to go down over the fish. This one here is for larger fish, such as catfish, bass, those type of fish. It would have been wrapped with sinew. Sinew comes from the uh, back strap or the deer leg of a deer, uh, the leg of a deer. <laughs> taking this sinew while it was wet and wrapped these pieces. After this was done, they would have taken pine rosin, sweet gum sap with a little charcoal in it and heated it side to fire and made actually a glue, a waterproof glue that they utilized on their arrows, on a lot of their spears, on anything that was gonna come in contact with moisture or a moisture just from the night or moisture in the water. Uh, it would have been put all over this to uh, weatherproof it. The fishing trap I have right here is made totally out of a uh, river cane that's found here along the river. Uh, the rings inside to make these hoops, they would have used willow. This right here is constructed, it has no strings, it has no, of course it didn't have nails back then or tacks. The pieces that it's wrapped with right here are actually the, whenever they cut the cane and it was green, they would actually cut these pieces off the sides of the cane pieces. Put them in water, keep them on pliable, and then wrapping each one of these around with a long piece of cane strip. Uh, this, like I said, this is all natural. They would have baited it up with, uh, say, coon innards or possum innards, uh, something really nasty for the catfish to eat. Uh, and then whenever the basket filled up, when you went back to check it, they would loosen off on the end right here, pour their fish out, put some more bait up in there and reset it along the creek or along the river.
fish hooks that the Muscogee people used here along the waterways uh, were mostly fashioned out of bone and stone. Uh, on a deer's leg, they would take on the leg bone itself and they would take a piece of flint and cut and scribe on the side of that leg until they fashioned a brim hook, what's equal to our brim hook nowadays. Uh, you could get, out of the toe bones of the deer, you could get uh, eight fish hooks out of one deer on the toe bones. Uh, the larger leg bones were also used for larger points. And they would take and, and scribe these out and then sharpen them on a rock, on a brace of stone. One of the hooks they used was called a straight hook. Uh, about the, for brim, it would be about a quarter of an inch long and made out of a slither of bone. Be pointed on both ends and the line would be tied in the middle. Uh, you would then take a piece of worm and put it on both sides, just loop it around. A fish does not bite. Most fish do not bite. They suck the bait into their mouths. And just like we drink from a straw, same principle. And they suck this bait into their mouth. And as it goes in, this straight hook turns sideways inside of their mouth. Thereby, it can't come back out the opening that their mouth is. So, and the bigger the fish, the bigger the straight hook you would make. fishing was made out of uh, the leaves of a yucca plant or one of the uh, palmettas and you also had a uh, bull nettle stinging nettle they would uh, plait the lines out of these were very durable uh, the bigger the plait the more strands you used the stronger the line was also they used sinew like I was telling you earlier to wrap their spears with, they also used this for fishing line. And it was very durable and hard to break. On preserving their fish after they made a catch, uh, a lot of times they would use nets that would also be 
woven out of sinew or stinging nettle or the uh, palmetto frond. Uh, after they procured their catch and cleaned it, uh, they smoked their fish a lot. In smoking it, uh, they killed all the bacteria that might get in it. Uh, it had, after smoking, it's got like a little leather uh, sheen on it that when you pull that back, it's flaky fish. Uh, this would allow them to keep the fish for up to three months in a dark, cool place. And this is the way they prepared it to uh, keep it like that. They had another method if they was gonna just cook some whilst they were there on the bank for supper or dinner, they would take the fish, clean it, take two bay leaves and put one on either side of the fish and then cover it in clay. And then after they covered it in clay all the way, got about a half inch thickness on this, they would take and throw it on the coals of the fire. They knew when the fish got done because the clay would actually crack around the edge of it, just a straight crack. Thereby you could just peel it open like this. The bay leaves have flavored your fish plus kept the clay off of the fish. So that's another way they cooked it or just straight over the fire on a stick. Another way that they, uh, they caught fish or procured fish was they on the creeks, on some creeks, they would build what they call a fish trap. They would have two walls coming out at an angle made out of logs and clay and rocks and have an opening about this big right in the middle of the creek. Warriors would get up on the upper side and actually drive the fish like cattle to this opening right here with the water spilling out. The women would take baskets, put up under this area right here, and as the warriors took the, the limbs and hit the water and drove the fish to this opening, the fish would fall off into the basket. After this lady got hers full, the next lady would come up behind her and do it again. So this is uh, one of the ways that they procured fish that was, you know, that we still could use today. They also would take uh, woven bags, woven out of these plant fibers, uh, and put green hickory nut shells in there. They dam up a pool of water with rocks. Then after they put the green hickory nut shells in the bag, they would beat them with a rock, releasing a milk type substance that was in these green shells. They would lay, it, lay this bag into the pool of water that they've dammed up. And uh, the fish, it'd take the, the hickory nut shells, the green hickory nut shells, would take the oxygen out of the water. Thereby the fish would float to the top of the water and they could just go along and pick them up and put them in a basket of water. He 
In preserving their catches of fish and meat, uh, they needed salt. And here in Monroe County, I know of uh, two places where they procured salt at in the woods. And those places are still, the deer still come to those places. And, uh, but they would procure the salt either from here in the hills or also uh, down around the coast, they would trade, trade the tribes down there for salt. Uh, the tribes would take a big vat that lived on the coast. They'd fill it with seawater. They'd let the water evaporate, thereby leaving the salt. Or they could cook it over a fire and let the water boil and evaporate, thereby leaving salt. Salt was a very, very highly prized commodity. For a pound of salt, you could have got a muzzle loader, enough shot and powder to last you for close to a year. That's how valuable salt was. Because without salt, you couldn't preserve your food properly. When y'all are traveling by boat in present day, think about all the villages here along the river when y'all are here fishing or just enjoying a family weekend. There was thousands of people along this waterway for the last 10,000 years or so. They lived, they thrived in their way of life here. So I thank you again. I hope you enjoyed it. Until the next time, Maro.